Hey, what's up you guys? My name is Danny. Welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel. I've been gone for a little bit for pretty much the entire month of November, but I do have good reason for that. And I can explain, I pinky promise, there were very valid reasons why I disappeared for another month. <laughs> One of these reasons is because of an opportunity that happened to fall into my lap that I didn't think was going to happen. Uh, at the beginning of November, I was granted the opportunity to be a press pass holder for the Denver Film Festival through my university. This year, the festival ran from November 2nd to November 13th. I originally had slated nine movies for the festival, but had to cut out three because of work and school priorities. But today, I'm going to talk a little more in depth about how I got this press pass opportunity, and I'm going to review the movies that I was able to catch at the festival. So, let's jump in, shall we? How did I even get a press pass? Well, to make a long story short, it was very last minute. I was in a lecture in an English class in the middle of October and I went to the website for Denver Film and I was like, you can fill out a press pass application just all willy nilly. So I did it. 20 minutes later, I kid you not, I got an email back approving my press pass through my university and that was it. I was in the books. I know it is different from city to city and the scale of the film festival. Denver is film festival is definitely a more localized festival. The entire concept of going to a film festival has always been intimidating yet fascinating. It's something I've always wanted to do more so from an attendee's point of view or even from a writer director's point of view, but never did I think I was going to be able to experience it as early as this year and from a press point of view. I think the Denver Film Festival was a really amazing opportunity for me to solidify my feet in the Denver film community and now I have so many more opportunities for Denver premieres and also to be at the film festival next year. The festival started on Wednesday night with James Gray's Armageddon Time and a pre-show reception and let me tell you it was the most intimidating thing to be in a room with virtually no one that you knew. Speaking of Armageddon Time. James Gray's Armageddon Time is a coming-of-age, auto-fictive movie about James Gray's childhood, taking place in Brooklyn circa 1980. It really felt like Gray thought he could process his childhood and white guilt through a slightly sloppy yet wonderfully cast film. You had Jeremy Irons putting on, in my opinion, one of the best performances as Paul's father. Even though it fit into the solidified cinematic stereotype of the abusive father, Irons knew how to work his tone and cadence to not wear out the character too early. Anthony Hopkins had me weeping in the theater. His character in such little time sets up this extremely developed relationship between him and his grandson Paul. Obviously, Anne Hathaway manages to sell her roles very well regardless of what movie she's in, though I did not feel nearly as impacted by her as the mother as I should have been walking out of the theater. It's really a haunting dramedy. It once again feeds into this slightly loose narrative with a lot of overarching themes and just following someone's life chronologically. The movie has this really real and unsatisfactory end which had people behind me grumbling and gr holding a grudge over, but for me, I felt like it was fitting to the overall tone of Armageddon Time. Personally, there are aspects of the movie that were handled extremely poorly and almost felt unnecessary at times. I wanted to take a moment to talk about Johnny, who was played by Jalen Webb. An amazing performance by an amazing actor and I'm so excited to see Jalen in so many different roles in his future. Overall, there was just this overwhelmingly cast shadow of white guilt on the film that made it a little hard to give it a higher rating. When I saw that there was going to be a showing for the YouTube effect and saw that it was directed by THE Alex Winter, I knew I had to get a press ticket. It was this chaotic yet fast-paced documentary that laid out the potential horrors of the literal platform I am talking to right now. Alex Winter brought content creators all across the board to talk about their experience on YouTube and alongside YouTube and maybe how YouTube has impacted them 
and really just wanted to show all sides, all flaws, and all positive aspects of this platform. Alexander takes an interesting approach as well in terms of showing that Google and YouTube are Pandora's boxes of types. And I think you can say that for a lot of social media platforms and the internet as a whole, but just how YouTube particularly can get overshadowed by documentaries about Facebook or Twitter. I think one of the most powerful moves in the movie was bringing Susan, uh, the CEO of YouTube, into the space so he could talk to her and confront her, just like Anthony had done on his I Spent a Day With series. Speaking of which, Anthony Padilla is a very important and prominent voice throughout the movie. I was really excited because I was able to catch Alex Winter at the end of the movie. He actually came to do a Q&A, but I stopped him after because, you know. And I talked to him about the YouTube effect, and I talked about why he picked certain creators to be in the movie because two of the main creators were ContraPoints and Anthony Padilla. And he talked about how he'd been in the YouTube space for a long time. He talked about how he had mentored the Fine Bros back in 2010, which was such a little interesting fact that I didn't really know a lot about. But to meet, oh my God, to meet Bill from Bill and Ted, like what? Rodeo was probably the movie that I knew the least about and wanted to walk in knowing absolutely nothing about it. It's this really fascinating coming of age film that has to do with motorbike culture in France. I wasn't the biggest fan of it because I felt like the story was lacking in a little bit of its heart. I felt like it almost gave documentarian vibes at times. And that is totally okay, but it wasn't what I was wanting out of the entire movie. I have to say, I can't spoil it because I do want there to be a wide release of it or a movie release because I do think people need to see it. But the ending of this movie had me on the floor crying. It is so beautifully shot. It is so metaphorical to the overarching theme of the main character of this movie. And I was just weeping. Burning Days was definitely my favorite film of the festival and probably one of my favorite movies of 2022. Burning Days has given me a new insight into political thrillers and how to shoot them and how to draw out suspense. I was blown away by all of the character portrayals in the movie and how little some of them had to say to captivate the viewer. It was kind of upsetting how easily it was to keep me emotionally hostage with this movie and the wor inner workings of it. I'm kind of upset that I saw this movie in a pretty empty theater because it really does deserve big screens and big audiences during any viewing. A lot of people refer to it as the Turkish version of Chinatown and I guess I felt like that a little bit but it really just felt like this big blockbuster to me. That could have been due to a lot of the aerial shots that were used in the movie and these really big wide shots. The movie grabs the viewer by the collar of their shirt and throws them into the world of rural Turkey as fast as it throws them out. And the director really has this viewer tethered between being trapped in the sky with those aerial shots and then watching it all happen right out of your control, right at eye level, like you are in Emre's shoes. There was an extensive use of diegetic sound that worked so well in the movie and worked in tandem with the themes of political corruption and wealth disparity. There was a constant highlighting of running water, a fan running, or a car driving. I really couldn't pull myself away from this thing. The dialogue, the cinematography. I love these blurred, drugged out flashbacks that were laced throughout the um, second and third acts of the movie. I felt like it really tied the entire thing together, like a little bow on a gift. So first things first, Sheila McCarthy was at my screening for Woman Talking. It was the closing night reception and she was awarded the Career Achievement Award. 
I'm sorry, I did not remember it at first. And she is just an angel and a darling and it was so amazing to hear her speak and to be watching her interviewed. She plays Greta in the movie and Greta is a mother and she is a mother herself and I think it was really endearing to hear her talk about all of this really important um, connectivity between the cast and her own personal life throughout Woman Talking and after Woman Talking and her personal relationship with director Sarah Poli as well. She's known her for years. I think she knew Sarah before she was in Go back in 99. Second of all, I was blown away by Woman Talking. I love a slow, dialogue-heavy movie. I love when dialogue has to carry such heavy weight on not only the characters, but the viewers themselves. And I felt like Woman Talking did that with a particularly harrowing concept. This was one of the ensemble casts of 2022 that I was not only extremely impressed by, but very moved by. I feel like there are a lot of movies these days that try to put out the ensemble cast and end up butchering it. This had perfect balance and was well thought out. And Sarah Pulley knew how to isolate each character's instances and their feelings and their thoughts within the world of the movie. And at the end of the day, these are some of my favorite performances of the year. Claire Foy, Rooney Mara. It was so gripping. I was sobbing throughout the entire thing. And I love when a movie breaks my heart and is able to break my heart in multiple ways and not just in a very sad, concrete, like romantic way. Anyways, those are the movies that I was able to catch at the festival. I really hope you all enjoy this short little video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on that bell notification for the next video. And comment down below if you've ever been to a film festival or if you want to go to one, which one would you want to go to? And I'll see y'all next time. Bye.